very much uh, for the invite, UVW, uh, and it's uh, always a pleasure to uh, come and discuss with uh, uh, workers who are at the forefront of the uh, struggle. Um, uh, rather than people having to look at my face uh, during this session, I'm going to share the screen and do a few slides, uh, and then when we get to the Q&A, you're going to have to put up with me again. So uh, forgive, let me hold on for a second or so while I try and sort out the share screen option. So. Okay, uh, can everyone see that? Have a thumbs up from people. Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, do this. So, um, yeah, I was I was asked to uh, do this presentation, and uh, as uh, as uh, has been said before, I uh, I joined the construction industry when I left school, and I've been a, a union activist uh, in and around the construction sector for, since then, um, and the. Uh, the title of all of the um, um, all of the talks put together is strikes, blockades, and uh, occupations uh, fighting for 150 years. Um, so I thought I'd uh, I'm not going to quite go back 150 years. Uh, uh, I'm going to go from about the 1970s uh, through. Um, and also, um, for me, the important thing isn't to just talk to people about what happened in the construction industry like it's just some interesting uh, piece of knowledge but i'm a union activist um i'm speaking to other union activists and really for me the the question is about what what lessons can you learn what can you take out of it for our own version of union organizing today uh from from you know learn over over many years uh, in the construction industry um and i've also noticed in the screen when when i was looking at the mass screen uh that there are um uh there are a number of people in the uh audience who uh, i actually were some of the disputes i'm going to talk about they were they were part of the dispute um so therefore if i get anything wrong i'm expecting them to come in and uh, uh explain to me where i've uh, uh where i've gone wrong uh, on on anything uh so so i'm also a big fan of uh, social media so if anyone decides to hashtag uh, or send out tweets or anything during during this then uh, the 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 uh, hashtags that uh, I, w I wanted to talk about um the, to start off with the construction industry uh, there, there's there's a couple of points why uh, why I want to do this first of all uh, it needs to be said that the construction industry's got a pattern of industrial relations and a pattern of uh, um, in industrial action which is really different to most other uh, sectors. Um, when, when you look at it from the outside, um, what it appears to be is long periods of um, almost industrial calm, where, there's, where there, there appears to be barely any uh, kind of uh, industrial action uh, at all, um, um, and then followed uh, uh, periodically with big explosions uh, of uh, industrial militancy where uh, when, where there are exactly strikes, blockades, and occupations uh, of building sites and of uh, of of uh, of, uh, of, of, union, of of head offices of uh, uh, companies, um, but almost always led not by the official unions but by uh, but unofficial industrial action um, in most circumstances led by um, what, what would be known, well, I'm certainly going to describe them as, as, as rank and file groups. So rather than the official unions leading industrial action, the, the industrial action, the strikes uh, and the blockades and the occupations are, are led uh, uh, by, by unofficial groups. Um, and to understand how this works and to understand how uh, the construction sector works, um, we have to have a bit of a knowledge about how the industry operates, but also who the big players are in the sector. 
Um, and yes, we've got to talk about the unions. Yes, we've got to talk about the employers. But as this is the history of class struggle, uh, we also have to talk about the role of the state um, and the role that the British state has had uh, in industrial, uh, shaping industrial action and, and shaping union organising in the uh, construction industry. Um, and as I said, my hope is that what we'll do is we'll feed into some of the broader discussions about union organising uh, that you're, you're having in your own union uh, and the rest of the labour movement is happy, having at the moment. So here we go, if I can get this to work. Next slide. So... So, fortunately, this one's going to be very quick because uh, it doesn't look very interesting. Uh, so, so one of the one of the points to, to to get across about the construction sector for me uh, is that it's different from some of the other uh, sectors that people may be used to, uh, and and there are certain things about construction that are different to virtually every sector in in, in the UK economy. First of all. Um, the, the, jobs finish <laughs> it might sound an obvious thing to do say but but when you're building a motorway or if you're building a an office block or if you're building a um you know a, a, I don't know, a power station at some point it actually stops because you've built it um and so the however many uh hundreds or thousands of workers have actually been working on that job and even if the union has built some kind of uh uh union structure and union organization on a particular job at some point the job comes to an end and however many hundreds or thousands of people are working there people are split off uh, and sent off all around the country working on loads of other small jobs again and even if you're working for the uh, the same big employer where there was a a um uh, a shop stewards committee and and the union might have been uh you know well organized on on, on a particular project once you're split off you're sent off to another job where you know 99.9% .9 of the time there will be no union uh, uh, organization on that job whatsoever um, and you're starting from scratch uh, uh, in, in order to uh, it, when you when you turn up there so even when we build union structure unlike say working in a big factory or working in a council uh, where union management negotiating structures basically carry on for generations and generations and if you're a new member of staff joining you can join and all the structures are already in place for most construction sites there's barely none of that at all other than a few big prestige jobs uh, which once again normally have to be fought for from the beginning then secondly there's the role of the employers and what you've got is virtually all there are a number of a very small number of sort of huge giant construction employers that everybody has heard of because they're well-known multinationals um, whether that be Sir Robert McAlpine, Carillion, Vinci, Skanskas, uh, Balfour Beatty, they're the big multinationals, they're known as tier one uh, contractors who virtually run the entire industry. They, they win the vast majority of all of the uh, big contracts um, and then everyone below them uh, there's there's a host of other companies but all of the other companies are are contracting from uh, this these big uh, multinationals so the big multinationals even if you're not working for a big multinational have got massive control over over what's going on uh, on any project um and because of the way construction works, even if you've got thousands of workers on a very large project, like a, uh, like a, a big power station, something like that, um, um, or, 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 or a big uh, you know, office block, you don't need thousands of people on there at the same time because it's the construction section construction process is 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 sequenced you know you start off with uh people digging trenches putting in foundations then you have put people putting up the 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 the, the, uh, the shell of the building whether that be through concrete or or or, uh, or steel uh, then the bricklayers will come in and put the face in on it you'll have carpenters come in and do the inside so the job is broken down into small uh, parcels and particles and even if there are thousands of people or a thousand people working on a job 
no one's working for you know you all might be turning up exactly the same time going home at the same time it might have Balfour Beatty written on the front of the uh, uh, holdings but everyone's actually working uh, for a, a variety it could be hundreds uh, of different companies working on the job all carrying out the different uh, tasks um, and these companies contract and subcontract and subcontract it all the way down until the workers themselves the vast majority of the workforce, certainly in the London area, um, but, uh, but in, uh, certainly in the contracting part, are classified by, the, uh, by their employer and classified by uh, uh, the, uh, the tax uh, department as uh, self-employed, that they're supposedly independent small contractors. In, in all honesty, this is, this, I mean, this is something that obviously UVW and, and, and other unions have come across as well. It's this, this bogus self-employment argument that we're not really self-employed. If, if a company tells me what time to start work in the morning, what time to go home, they provide all of the equipment, all of the uh, uh, materials. They pay me by the hour when I'm there and I'm directed in what to do by one of their supervisors, then I'm clearly working for that company. The, but the fact that they uh, class me as self-employed, uh, whether you know through an agency or through a variety of these bogus self-employment schemes, what it means is I have no legal employment rights. So it's you know it becomes difficult. To, well, you can't claim redundancy even if I've worked there for a very long period of time. Um, I can't claim unfair dismissal because you can only claim unfair dismissal if you're a direct employee of a company. Not even if you're a classed as a tier a limb to. Uh, um, you know, worker, uh, in inverted commas, you, you can't claim unfair dismissal, which therefore, from a trade union point of view, you've got a, a sector where people are moving around all the time, temporarily, uh, is very itinerant, uh, it's very short term, sometimes when I worked in the sector, the average length of time I, I worked on a job was would be three or four months. In fact, very often the jobs would be a few weeks. I think the longest job I ever had was uh, uh, about 18 months. Um, so, so you've got people work moving all around the place, you've got these multinationals that dominate the sector, but even if you've got a big congregation of workers, they're working for loads of different companies, and all of the workers are nominally self-employed with no uh, employment rights. So even if you're sacked, you can't go to an employment tribunal uh, to, to claim anything. And then added to that, um, um, uh, and, and the, sorry, let me just go back because I wanted to talk about the state. Um, the lack of employment rights, of course, is directly attributable to the British state because over, over decades, the, uh, the various governments of whatever political persuasion have accepted the argument that uh, construction workers are all self-employed because you own a bag of tools, uh, basically. Um, and therefore, they're the people who have, have explicitly uh, taken any employment rights uh, from us. Uh, they've also, of course, given these uh, subcontractors by, by making us self-employed. It's, it's basically a big, like a, a, a 10% uh, uh, government subsidy to, to any uh, employer in the construction industry because they uh, don't have to pay national insurance uh, for us because we're not uh, employed by them, apparently. Uh, next one. So, um, so then added to that, because those are all basically difficult, is it makes it difficult for, for unions to, to, to organise. The, the construction sector is famous uh, or infamous maybe for the fact that the uh, the major construction companies hate trade unions. Uh, and the uh, this this group of talks that the um, that the UVW is, is doing uh, says 150 years of struggle. Uh, well, actually, uh, this this first thing that I've that I'm highlighting here, the document, um, the document was uh, something that was produced in 1834, so nearly 200 years ago, uh, and all of the big major construction employers 
had a meeting in London and uh, voted on producing a document that everyone who worked for a construction company up and down the country was forced to sign. And the document said you could only work for the company if you weren't a member of a trade union. So literally, if you were a member of a trade union, you weren't allowed to join. And unless you sign this document to say you weren't going to be a, a, a trade union member, you couldn't join. So, so this is 1840, it's the same time as the... Uh, um, uh, the toll puddle martyrs, if you're going to do some stuff about that, you know, the birth of uh, 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 in, in trade unions uh, in the UK. But then through throughout time, so trade unions have always been victimised by uh, the big employers. Um, but also as, as, as years developed, uh, you've had uh, various organisations that were set up, sort of secret organisations by the employers, explicitly set up in order to stop trade unionists getting onto building sites. So in 1919, uh, there was an organization called the Economic League uh, set up. It was set up by ex uh, military intelligence people, um, all major industrialists uh, uh, in the construction sector and loads of other sectors uh, were involved in this. Uh, uh, members of parliament, uh, right wing members of conservative party were involved in this and what they did is they he held a secret blacklist on people who wanted, uh, people who were active in trade unions, people who had left wing politics and every time you applied to get a job uh, uh, in one of these big companies they'd check to see if your name was on the black economic league blacklist and if you were they, they, they sacked you uh, basically. Um, and then the economic league closed down in 1990 uh, because there was a uh, a big uh, outrage in the newspapers about it and what happened uh, is lots of the companies are involved sort of ran a mile because of the bad publicity but not in construction in construction the big major construction companies and this picture uh, there is that man that man's name is Cullen McAlpine uh, he's uh, one of the owners of uh, the big multinational construction company Sir Robert McAlpine Limited Sir Robert McAlpine Limited built the Olympic Stadium they're one of the huge multinationals Cullen McAlpine bought the blacklist off of uh, the Economic League when it was closed down for £20,000 and set up a brand new organisation called the Consulting Association which from 1992 till 2009 once again uh, infiltrated union meetings, kept secret files on construction workers who complained about health and safety or unpaid wages and if you applied to get a job on any of the big construction projects, you didn't have to be working for the big multinationals. Um, even if you're working for a small company, because the multinationals were running the job, they would check to see if your name was on this list. And if you were on the list, basically you were uh, you were sacked. Uh, was 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 how it worked. Uh, and most of the time, you never got a job in the first place. So blacklisting. So if you're a union activist, as well as all of the difficulties of the structural setup of the sector, you've also got this um, sort of industry-wide uh, victimization program, systematic, uh, that they checked every name going onto any big uh, project. Uh, next slide. Um, so, um, if it was just the big employers, that would be a bad, you know, bad enough. But the uh, but the British state, I said there was always there's three players in this: the employers, the unions, and the state. So the British state as well, um, from the 1970s onwards, but probably even before that, have had uh, a variety of different uh, uh, police units. That entire their entire purpose is to spy on the left, uh, is to spy on uh, political activists, but, but certain sections of them were specifically set up to spy on trade unions. So the Special Branch Industrial Unit was set up with the sole intention uh, of spying on trade unions. There's a, there's a group within MI5, uh, which is called F, F Division, which is there to spy on the left and, and, and trade unions as well. And these, these organisations have been involved in spying on union activists uh, for a very long time. And because, they're, because of... Uh, the uh, campaign uh, that uh, 
uh, we, we led in the Blacklist Support Group uh, to expose the Blacklist and to expose the role of the police. We now know for a fact, uh, because the Metropolitan Police have admitted it uh, and sent letters to our lawyers admitting it, and there's a public inquiry into this, that the police provided information to these illegal blacklists. So the, the consultant association, which was illegal, um, the police supplied information to it. One of these units, the National Extremism and Tactical Coordination Unit, NETCO, um, one of the, a senior officer, uh, his name's DCI Golden Mills, actually gave a PowerPoint presentation, a bit like I'm giving a PowerPoint presentation to you. He came along and gave a PowerPoint presentation to this uh, uh, illegal blacklisting organisation, a consultant association made up of all directors of multinational companies, basically in the PowerPoint presentation telling the companies how they can, uh, they should have vetting services in place to stop uh, left-wing activists and others uh, getting jobs with their companies. Well, the consultant association was doing that uh, uh, already. Someone's put their hand up. Uh, yep. Yeah. Does someone want to come in and say something? No, okay. Um, I'll I'll continue on this. Uh, please, when I when I need to stop, I'm speaking for too long. I haven't got a watch, so please please tell me if I'm going on too long. Um, so so the next slide, just to give people the uh, the level of intrusion of the British state uh, into trade unionism, and and I'm just concentrating on the construction uh, uh, section. This this person here is his name is Mark Cassidy. Now, I knew Mark Cassidy in the 1990s. Um, he would, when I met him, he was a carpenter. Um, I've been on picket lines with him. I've been at union meetings with him. I've been at uh, uh, lobbies of uh, uh, employers' uh, uh, bodies with him. I've even been to conferences with him. Um, his real name was Mark Jenner. I knew him for three years. He lived with one of my friends, an, an, another left-wing activist. Um, uh, and he had a passport, a national insurance number and everything in the name of Mark Cassidy. Um, he was a member of my union, UCAT, and he used to regularly turn up to uh, U, uh, Hackney branch of UCAT, where we lived. His real name actually uh, was Mark Jenner, and he was an undercover police officer. Um, and he was sent in to infiltrate trade unions uh, and, and spy on activists. And he was actually a member of this organisation, the Special Demonstration Squad, uh, which sent in uh, people to spy on uh, trade unions and other activist groups. Uh, uh, I, I certainly knew him and his deployment lasted about five years. Um, so this isn't just someone who puts on a hoodie and turns up at a protest. This is someone who's given a new identity and living with the activists and living with, you know, turning up to meetings. You know, he actually sort of, he's, he used to chair some of the meetings, uh, this fella. Um, and what he was actually doing was spying on trade unionists and sending it to uh, Special Branch. And Special Branch have already admitted that they provided information that was given to the, uh, uh, to, to the blacklisting organisation. Um, so let's move on so 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 as you can imagine it's quite it's quite a hostile environment for trade unionists in the in the construction sector uh, people you know the, the big employers don't like us very much so therefore over many many years uh the the activists have developed uh, their own model of union organising long before anyone wrote books about union organising long before anyone uh uh, you know, did training courses on union organising. The, the the activists themselves have uh, have developed their own model of union organising, um, and we've got to remember that when they go, the vast majority of building sites they go on to, there's no union there in the first place. It's a bit like a, a pre recognition stage uh, if you were trying to get recognition in a workplace, um, and also you're changing jobs once every three months or once every six months. So each time you start a new job, even if you had managed to get a union, you've got to start again over and over again. And so the main feature of the model uh, of union organising is actually that it's done sort of covertly. Um, that 
rather than displaying the fact that they're union people, uh, because if they display the fact they'll get sacked almost instantly um, uh, and added to the blacklist, what they do is they try and organise amongst the workers almost covertly or semi-covertly, a lot of the time barely even talking about the union, but talking to people down the pub or in the cafe or in the canteen, just about trying to get better health and safety on the job, about getting a pay rise, uh, about being treated, the, you know, better, better toilet facilities, uh, a lot of the, of the case. And, and only when the activists think they've got enough people around them that if they go public, they won't be sacked, do they then actually call a meeting in the canteen and try and get the union uh, set up. And at that point, this going public to have a, have a meeting, uh, it becomes like the, the, device, the decisive point. Because at that point, either the, either because the, the manager's going to come in and sack you. It's, it's you know, it's 99% of the time. If, as soon as you call the, the meeting in the canteen, uh, the, the, the management don't like you, they're going to try and get you off the job. So if they get you off the job, the question is, have you got enough people around you, enough fellow workers whether they're you know carpenters bricklayers electricians around you to stick with you to defend your job or are you sacked uh, and because if you're sacked then the management of uh, uh, of uh, completely uh, you know re reinforce their their dominance of the building site if the workers stick together and you get reinstated basically the union's one recognition even if the uh, the employer doesn't nom you know officially recognize you in reality the union's operating uh, and and in order to make sure that we keep everyone together the other very common theme throughout all of the uh, th th that they did was have regular meetings almost like once a week in the canteen they'd have have meetings for the workers what they call shop have a shop meeting where everyone can debate things uh, on a regular basis so rather than only meeting once a month or once every two or three months or just sending out emails regular workplace meetings to make sure that you you build that cohesion and see that you're doing things collectively rather than just electing a shop steward and the shop steward goes and meets management and never comes and talks to the uh, workers all the time so it's very much a direct democracy way of doing it and it's it's covert up until the point where you have to go public because there's going to be a you know the big disputes tend to be about victimization uh, victimization and pay obviously um so um so that's what happens on building so that's when you're just one worker getting on there at one activist getting on there but the activists also link together so even though you might only have one activist on one job and another activist on another job somewhere else, um, and then even if you build unionization, you're split off all over the place, what they've done in construction from basically the 1960s onwards, and probably if I go back before that, you know, we can, we can find these uh, uh, things, is you've got the activists themselves set up rank and file networks ad hoc rank and file networks that are not part of the official union um and and these groups uh you know th there's two photographs here the first photograph in black and white is uh, from the 1970s it's the shrewsbury pickets so there was a mass you know there was the national builder strike uh, in 1972. Uh, the first time there'd been a national builder strike, it was the biggest pay rise the construction workers had ever won uh, in, the, uh, in the construction industry. Um, and um, afterwards, uh, a number of 24 construction workers got, uh, uh, got, uh, got sent to court and a number of them got sent to prison. And they're known as the Shrewsbury Pickets. And the two people here, the one, the bloke on the left smiling in the leather jacket, his name's uh, Des Warren. Uh, he got three years, got sentenced to three years. Uh, and the bloke in the middle in the pinstripe uh, suit and the beard, uh, that's the famous actor Ricky Tomlinson, because when he came out of prison, he, became, he couldn't get a job in the building industry, became an actor. Um, and they, uh, Ricky Tomlinson got two years. Uh, in in jail uh, because of because of Shrewsbury that was in the 1970s and effectively the the national construction uh, building workers strike was effectively led by a rank and file group called the building workers charter it wasn't made official by the union until the strike had been going on for weeks uh, and it was the the rank and file group that organized all the picketing uh, organized all the mass meetings that had called for the action and the second photo the color photograph is from black Friday this was a dispute in uh, 2013 uh, where once again uh, 
the uh, what you had is uh, for electricians there's a national uh, agreement for electricians uh, which um, uh, which is called the Joint Industry Board, and all of the big construction companies basically wanted to tear it up and reduce everyone's pay by 30%, 35% pay cut. Went from six, was going to go from £16 an hour to £10 an hour. And what happened is basically a rank and file group was set up literally out, almost out of nowhere. Um, they had a meeting in uh, Conway Hall, and the first meeting they had 500 people turn up at it. And basically, at this meeting, uh, the rank, they, they set up a group called the Construction Rank and File, and they basically said, right, we're going to lead a strike, an industrial dispute against the uh, uh, electrician, the big electrical companies. And that dispute went on for about six months. Um, if, we've got, if you've seen the video footage of any of it that's produced by Real News, I mean, there's some spectacular stuff. This, this particular photograph was taken outside Blackfriars uh, Railway Station at about... Uh, half past six in the morning when we had 300 electricians blockading the road uh, and they were running battles with the police uh, and had police dogs and everything. We literally shut the job down uh, uh, that day. Did it get anything in the press? Nothing. The mainstream media never tell that story. But nonetheless, after a six month dispute, the uh, the uh, the entire it was known as the Besner dispute, uh, which was the new uh, thing they were trying to introduce. The pay cut got scrapped, and uh, the JRB carries on uh, uh, to this day. So moving on, uh, so so there are a number of different groups uh, from the 1960s. Uh, through to today, basically, uh, these rank and file groups that people didn't, the, pretty much all of the industrial action, you know, you know, virtually 99.9% .9 of industrial action within construction is unofficial is not led by the unions, because the unions cannot lead uh, the, uh, uh, you know, cannot call an official uh, dispute, uh, precisely because the, uh, we wouldn't be able to um, uh, comply with uh, the laws for industrial action. So pretty much all of the disputes are led by these rank and file groups. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, you had these groups called Building Workers Charter uh, and the Joint Sites Committee. In the 1980s, you had a group called Building Worker Group. Um, in the 1990s, you had another group called the Joint Sites Committee, which was a sort of re reimagining of that. In the for people who worked in the North Sea, the offshore industry, there was a rank and file group called the Offshore Industry Liaison Committee, which organised sit-ins and protests on oil rigs across the North Sea uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and then in um, in once again, even today, uh, you've got this construction rank and file that led one of the biggest disputes uh, in the last uh, in the last decade, uh, and it was set up. Uh, and, and the key points I've put on there uh, is, is about what these rank and file groups actually are. First of all, they're like support networks for workers in the dispute. Secondly, they're not part of the official union structures. Even if, even if the people running them, you know, it's, it's, it's led by lay activists, rank and file activists, rather than official paid officials of the union. Um, so, so you might have someone who is a member of the union, who, who actually might even be like a branch secretary or a branch chair might be running these things, but they're not paid officials of, uh, of the existing unions. But what these rank and file groups do is rather than sort of send motions to conference in order to try and make the union more left wing, they basically just organise industrial action in their own name. So, so the construction rank and file literally organised a dispute that lasted six months in their own name. The, the, the Offshore Industry Liaison Committee blockaded and, 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 and ran occupations of building sites. The Joint Sites Committee organised disputes for, for over a decade uh, uh, in London. We've got lots of, in fact, we've just found a lost videotape from the 1990s uh, that we're getting remastered uh, to show the uh, industrial disputes from the 1990s that we organised. And the other key thing about this uh, is they're not merely a front for a, a particular political group because most of these organisations they would, most of these rank and file groups that I've talked about would have people from a variety of different political organisations in it. But when they're fighting the employer, 
directly fighting the employer a lot of the time. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not dewy eyed and making out that we never had disputes and arguments amongst ourselves. Of course we did. But because the majority of what we were doing was fighting the employer, it was a dispute about winning, getting someone reinstated or winning a pay rise or stopping uh, people dying on building sites. When you're fighting the employer, pretty much most of us agreed on the same tactics, you know. So, so, so it brought people together, uh, irrespective of their political position. This Builders Crack was a uh, a fanzine that we produced in uh, in London for building workers from the, the London Joint Sites Committee. Produced that. We had a print run of five thousand of that. And it came out once every three months, and it was on every big major construction site uh, uh, in 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 London. Uh, next one, that's it. So, I'm I'm. Uh, oh, let me go back. Uh, I'm. Uh, that's that's pretty much it. I didn't really have a conclusion. Uh, what my uh, <laughs> it was about telling you how we work, telling you how we operate, and I've got there. I know for a fact there's other construction workers in this meeting who may slightly disagree with some of the points I've made. By all means, it's a democracy. Let's have a you know let's debate about it. But for me, um, the class struggle in the construction sector is against a very very hostile employer. You know, we can have, I could, I could have talked about violence. I could have talked about our members being hospitalized and beaten up by, by employers, thugs. It's well documented, some of that stuff. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the police and the role of the state, but really, you know, we, we are precarious workers with very little employment rights fighting against hostile employers. And I think even if, the exact model that we use for union organizing in construction isn't you know, instantly transferable to every other sector, because I don't think it is. There are some sectors where it wouldn't work at all. But I do think there are certain lessons that we can pull out of it. Uh, and there are certain discussions we can have about how we organize in a variety of different sectors and the gig economy and precarious workers and bogus self-employment is only getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it's it's not something that's getting smaller. 